Awesome. All right. So thank you so much, Ella, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As Ella said, my name's Krista. I'm the researcher and curator at the Shingwak Residential School Center. Um, to start things off, I really want to acknowledge where I am speaking from. I am uh, on Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, and uh, this is land that has been used and lived on by the Anishinaabe and Metis people since time immemorial. Really want to acknowledge the forever history of this land and also the uh, significance of the site that the Shingwak Residential School is on. Sorry, I'm just gonna try and get rid of the notifications at the top that I am seeing. Sorry. Um, beyond that, I also want to acknowledge that I am here and I'm speaking as a settler. I've had the pleasure to work with the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association and the local survivor community for about a decade. And it's really their work that I want to showcase today and that I feel so honored to be a part of. Uh, none of what I'm talking about today would have happened without the work of the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. Likewise, the other thing I want to point out before we get started is that I am showing a select number of images relating to residential schools. And this history can be challenging, it can be triggering, it can be difficult to process. And if you need to take a break, if you need to step out, I completely understand that. Uh, likewise, if you need to talk to one of our staff afterwards, I know there's a number of us in the chat and myself on the video, um, we're here if you need just someone to talk through. Um, for the purposes of accessibility, I've also um, put my slides at the link that's on the bottom of this page um, and all the images have alt tags. So if you prefer to have it open in your own screen while I'm going through, that's an option. To get started, um, I am going to uh, talk about place. And so the two images on the site here are of the Shingwak site. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about place. The image that is on the left is of the original Shingwak home that opened in Sault Ste. Marie, Ba Wa Ting in 1873. And so this residential school opened on the banks of St. Mary's River and it opened to about 50 students. It was on a site that was about 100 acres and it was modeled after residential schools that were across Canada and students attended Shingwak from all across the land. So as far south as Sarnia, Walpole Island, as far north as the James Bay Coast in northern Quebec and also students from Northwest Territories, the Western provinces, and a few from Eastern Canada. So that, I'm telling you this because it really, I think helps illuminate the fact that the history that I'm talking about today, though it's definitely rooted in place, it's rooted in the history of Sault Ste. Marie, of the Shingwak home. It's really far reaching. The survivor community that we work with at the Shingwak Residential School Center they live all over the place. Many of them live in the United States. Some live in Ontario and in Bawa Ting. Some live in Quebec and all over Canada. Uh, so the history is really far reaching. The second photo that's on this slide, so the colored photograph, 
Uh, this is a picture of Shangwak Hall. So the original uh, Shangwak home building by the 1930s, they had added an addition onto it as a girl's wing, um, but it was also a space that by 1935, it didn't have running water, it didn't have electricity, it was really poorly heated and um, cared for, and part of the building was starting to like crumble and deteriorate. And so the Canadian government decided it would be cheaper to build a new building than tear down and tear down the original one and try and repair. And so in 1935, new Shenwalk Hall opened. So it continued to operate as a residential school until 1970. In 1970, it closed and Algoma University what was then Algoma University College, moved in to the building. And when Algoma moved into this building, it, it came with a lot of questions. In the 1970s, if you had uh, talked to a faculty member, to other people who worked at the university, and said, hey, this is a really old building. What was it before Algoma came here? no one would have said it was a residential school. Part of it was the history of residential schools wasn't as widely talked about in the 1970s, but there was also some institutional forgetting going on during this period. They just didn't want to talk about this history. It really was the survivor community who worked to make sure that this history wasn't forgotten. Uh, so pictured on this slide is Dan Pine. He's a survivor of the Shenwak Residential School. He is also a descendant of Chief Shenwak Holmes. And he was one of the people who really clearly said, you need to bring survivors together. They are the ones who care about these, this site. They're the ones who are gonna make sure that this site does the work that it needs to do, that it's gonna put back what the residential schools took away. So in 1981, the first Shangwak reunion was held on this site. It was really organized as a school reunion. It invited former students from the Shangwak Residential School to come back and just connect with other survivors. They really didn't know in the 1980s how many people would be interested in coming back and talking about this history. They thought, okay, maybe we'll get 50 people. Over the course of the weekend, they had over 300 people attend the reunion. And this was really because there was such a desire to be able to talk about what happened at residential schools and to connect with other people who attended residential school. This is pretty significant when you think about the fact that this was in 1980. In the 1980s, there's still residential schools open. There is not a national conversation going on about the harms of residential schools. And this gathering was one of the first of its kind in all of Canada to bring survivors together and begin to talk about the experiences of residential school. And one of the other things that happened with this gathering was the founding of the Children of Shingwalk Alumni Association, a survivor and intergenerational survivor organization dedicated to preserving the history of this site and talking about the history of the Shingwalk site. And this is also where the Shingwalk Residential School Center archives started. People showed up at the reunion with a desire to have their story told their experiences recorded. They might've shown up with a single photograph or a single document related to their time at residential school and wanted a way to be able to share that with other survivors. And that's how the grassroots community-based archive at the Shingwak Residential School uh, was first started. So I'm going to shift a little bit now to talk about how the Reclaiming Shingwa Hall exhibition space came together. And I really want to foreground 
that, yes, it's me talking about this exhibit right now, but this exhibit is not just my work. It is the work of decades. It's the work of community. Uh, conversations about this space started happening in 2012. But prior to that, the Children of Shingwalk Alumni Association had been working for decades to make sure that the truth about residential schools was told and that um, the site was honored in an appropriate way. So when I talk about this exhibition, it really was an iterative community-based design process. Survivors were integrated in everything from the design of the space to picking out individual photos. Uh, the Shingwonk Residential School Center applied for numerous grants to help facilitate survivors coming together so that they could be paid for their work, their time, and that they could be in community when discussing this exhibit and their hopes and dreams for it. So the exhibition itself opened in August 2018. Uh, this is from the opening ceremonies and I mean, it was a packed space. And I think when we were working on the exhibit and planning it, I don't think we understood what an impact it would have. I mean, we realized it was significant locally, but nationally and internationally, I don't think we had quite realized how important this space would be. The Reclaiming Shinwalk Hall exhibition is the first uh, survivor-driven permanent exhibition housed in a former residential school building. That is really significant. I remember uh, looking back at some of our early grant proposals and hoping that we might get, you know, the modest um, visitorship of 3,000 people through it in a year. And in the first year that it was open, we had uh, closer to 15 or 20,000 folks through it. And that is really because of the site that it's located on and the importance and the type of history that's being shared and talked about in this exhibition space. So I wanna talk a little bit about that space. It is in the main hallway of Shenghua Hall that was a residential school. And the entrance point to the exhibition are the front doors of the residential school. And so on the one side, you can see a historical photograph uh, from the 1940s that shows those doors. And the other side is a contemporary picture of the interior of the exhibition space today. And they're the same doors. And part of the reason those doors are there and that they're the entrance point has so much to do with the Shingwak survivor community. There was actually a conversation going on around the same time that this exhibition was being installed about these doors. The university was undergoing renovations to make it more energy efficient. And you can kind of see it in this photograph. These doors, they're pretty old. They have a hard time closing tightly. There's a lot of air loss, fire safety regulations and things like that, that they could be modernized. And so there was a conversation around, we're talking about replacing these doors. The Shingwak survivor community really spoke up about the importance of these doors remaining, about them as a testament to the experiences of residential school survivors and their experiences arriving at residential school. And so I think it's pretty significant that those doors are still there, that the university said, yes, we completely understand we are going to keep those doors. And as an entry point to the Reclaiming Shinwa call space, it's, I think, very powerful and it's very apt that that is the space that people walk through. They walk through those doors today and it's impossible 
to not know that this was a residential school. On one side of the doors is a reflection from Mike Kakaji, a survivor, about his memories of the first time he entered a residential school. And for him, he really remembered the lights. It was the first time he saw electric lights and the smell of the space and it being a hospital type smell. Um, and so sharing Mike's words in that entrance space, I think are really important. Likewise, paired with Mike's words is a reflection on the site today and a reflection of welcoming to Anishinaabe and Métis territory and acknowledging the sacred history of this site as a place of learning and a place that's being transformed by the work of the survivor community. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about different sections of the Reclaiming Xinhua Call exhibition. And the first section is the Life at Xinhua Gallery. It's really looking at daily life at the Xinhua home. And so one thing you can probably tell by this picture is this isn't a normal museum gallery space or normal exhibition space. This is the main hall of a functional university. It's the main hall of a building that was a residential school. So there's definitely challenges with how we picked material for the space. For example, there's not really many 3D objects in the space. They just wouldn't fit in a functional hallway. Um, but also trying to fit, you know, over a hundred years of student experiences and history into a space that is smaller was definitely a challenge. Uh, this space here, though, really focuses on the daily life of students. So the section that this photo of focuses on the uh, beginning of the Shenghua home until 1935, so when that original building was on the site. And the second section focuses from 1935, the opening of the new Shenghua Hall till its closure in 1970. So exactly as I was saying, like how do you pick photos to exhibit almost 100 years of residential school history in Sault Ste. Marie? How do you pick photos that balance truth, community needs? Uh, how do you pick photos that aren't triggering to community members? And if they are triggering, what supports are in place? And one of the conversations we also had is how to really represent those early years of the residential school where none of the survivors are still alive. So the 1800s, early 1900s, like the photo that's on the slide here, how do you talk about those years when the photographs and a lot of what is written about that time period is from the staff and the church perspective? Um, part of it has been thinking a lot about what interpretive text goes alongside any photograph that is exhibited or included in the space. Likewise, this is really where working with the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association has been so important and so crucial to the development of the Reclaiming Shingwak Hall space. So we worked with a really large group where we showed initial design concepts based on ideas the Children of Shingwak had but then worked with a smaller volunteer group who they went through every single word that is on those walls. They also helped pick out every photograph that's on these walls, making sure that it was community needs and community aims that were at the forefront of this exhibition. Uh, part of it was also trying to be really creative with how we exhibited photographs. So using a variety of mediums to share the photos. Uh, so the image on the slide here actually shows a couple different photo treatments. The, um, under the heading Life at Shinwak Home, the 
boys that are in the farm on the bottom, that's actually a vinyl wallpaper. And then on the left of the image, you see glass. And so these are images that were etched onto glass and overlaid. So we're able to kind of have multiple tiers of image within a small space. Uh, the ones that are on the glass are actually the original archival images were tin types. And so the decision to put them on the glass also reflects an idea of trying to mimic some of the look of those original tin types. We also integrated digital photo frames throughout the exhibition. This was one way that we were able to include more photographs than physically fit on the walls. Likewise, it gives us an opportunity to be able to update the exhibit or add new photographs at any given time. Since this is a permanent exhibition, we wanted some spaces that were a little bit more flexible. Um, so this panel here is actually probably the one that I love most out of the entire exhibit because it really speaks to the challenges of working with archival documents and photographs. It's talking about the fact that not everything you see in the photographs are is an accurate representation of the past. Um, so photos might suggest that students were happy at the residential school and that residential schools were benign in how they operated. Um, but this panel clearly articulates the fact that, you know, many residential school photographs are heavily staged, that the pieces of history that we have are a result of colonial systems and colonial collecting patterns. Uh, archives only kept what they wanted, teachers only kept what they wanted, and who got photographed in residential schools was a result of the work of staff and principals and church organizations. So facing the Life at Shingwak Home Gallery is a second gallery space called the Children of Shingwak Gallery. And when I say facing, it's on the opposite side of the hallway. So, you know, you can stretch out your arms and touch both gallery spaces if you wanted to. Uh, so one of the interesting things about this space is we actually hadn't planned for this gallery. Initially, we didn't know that we would get that space. The plan was for the exhibition space to have one wall and then I'll go to university, keep one wall for like internal communications and you know signage and things like that. But as plans evolved, it was decided that the exhibition could be both sides of this particular hallway. And it is really a celebration of Anishinaabe resilience, Anishinaabe success. It celebrates both uh, survivors and intergenerational survivors. It includes a family panel, for example, that has a family tree of the Fletcher family and talks about intergenerational connections to the Shingwak and Algoma site. And getting to walk down this hallway and see the smiling faces of the children of Shingwak alumni survivors on, you know, a regular basis has been wonderful. Um, and I'm really glad that that is there alongside the daily life at residential school gallery because I think it shows like residential schools happened, survivors are still alive, the impacts of residential school are still happening, but also the children of Shingwak alumni survivors and other survivors in our community are some of the most amazing, kind, and generous people I have ever met. And so being able to celebrate them and honor them, I think is really important. The final gallery in this space um, that's from the first phase of the Reclaiming Shingwa Call exhibition is called From Teaching Wigwam to Residential School. And so this is a, I'd say, probably the most ambitious gallery in this space. It goes from 
talking about Chief Shane Wakons and his vision for teaching wigwams and cross-cultural education to talking about the establishment of colonial systems in this region, to missionary work, and how the early uh, Shingwak site was established and how it changed over the years, um, kind of all the way up to 1970. So covering a huge amount of history in a relatively small space. This is definitely the most, I'd say, text heavy section of the exhibition. And it covers a lot of ground, but I think there's also really clever use of photographs here that match the text. Uh, there's also a couple maps included in this section that serve as really good visuals for when we're bringing school groups through so they can get a sense of what the site looked like prior to Oklahoma University uh, being located where it is today. So the next gallery space, this one opened in 2019. Uh, so about a year after the original, um, their first phase of the Reclaiming Shane Walk project opened. And the school's gallery uses objects to talk about residential schools or artifacts. And the idea here is providing a less text heavy space, a space that tells the history of the numerous iterations of the Shinwok School and the lives of students there through physical things. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the sewing machine that's located in this space. Uh, so Fran Fletcher Luther, who's pictured on this slide, is a survivor who attended the Shinwok Residential School and she donated her sewing machine for the exhibition space. And that's the sewing machine that you see there. Uh, so Fran attended the Chaplow Residential School as well as uh, the Shingwak Residential School. And a lot of her time was spent working in the laundry room, in the sewing room, and darning socks, making clothes, making repairs to clothes. When she left residential school, Fran took those skills that she was forced to learn and do at the residential school and turned to making clothing for herself, clothing for family members, and really reshaped that skill to be something that she carried in her community and a skill that she used regularly. And so the sewing machine kind of reflects that taking of that skill and it's something she wanted to see in this space as a way to talk about her experience at residential school. And so as I said, this space has very little text. Uh, there's text hanging on uh, the hangers there underneath the photographs and there's some text that you can see over with the woodworking tools. But in most cases, that text is actually uh, quotes from survivors about their experiences with different physical spaces in the residential schools or their experiences doing particular activities or particular types of work in the residential school. One of the challenges with this space is the fact that we were talking about the entire history of the Shingwak site. So that includes um, the 1800s, early 1900s, where we don't have any living survivors. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to incorporate like some of the names of the boys who worked in the carpentry shop in the early years, uh, largely thanks to one of my colleagues, Jenna LeMay, who was working with a set of archival records that included um, information about some of those early students. And so I think it's really important that we were able to name who those students were. Uh, likewise, because the first Shingwak reunion happened in 1981, at that 1981 reunion, there was actually some survivors who were still alive from the earlier years of the residential school or from the residential school before the new Shingwak Hall was built. And so some of their experiences and testimonies were recorded and written down at that gathering. 
and they were able to be incorporated in this space with permission from uh, the Children of Sharing Walk Alumni Association. And I think this space is really powerful because it gives you both the words of survivors, but visuals as to what those spaces looked like. Um, and I think the space was also, there were some challenges around it. So for example, how do you pick which items or objects end up in this space? And where's the line between telling the truth and um, causing like emotional distress or emotional harm? And so, for example, talking about the dormitories is something that is particularly challenging for a lot of survivors. And this photograph is in that exhibit space. And one of the things that became really clear through this process was the importance of working with the Children of Shinwalk Alumni Association and them guiding the decision process. I mean, there was definitely cases where there was conflict on what one survivor versus another survivor might think should go in this space. But as a community, the survivors work together to make decisions about what objects and which photos would end up in here. Um, so in terms of next steps for this project, we have more plans and some of them are currently underway. So the parts of the project that I just shared with you are, you know, there's two hallways that include uh, exhibition material that's mostly uh, photographs and text. Then there is that object-driven space, and that's actually in a vestibule to an auditorium space. And the photo on this slide is a historical photo of what that auditorium looked like during the residential school era. And it's actually one of the few spaces at Algoma that hasn't been completely renovated. That woodwork that's up on the ceiling, that is still there and still visible. The original hardwood floors are still there. And it's a space that for the children of Shingwak and survivor community has been really important and then holds a lot of meaning. So it's a space that many survivors have okay or sometimes good memories associated with. Um, and that's something of a rarity of a space in a residential school. But this space acted kind of like a school gym. So a space where students sometimes did physical exercise, where they put on plays and musical performances was also a space where things like Christmas celebrations happened. If students were able to visit with any family members in the later years of the residential school, it would have been in this space as well. Um, so it's a space that the survivor community has continued to come back to and continue to hold events in and sees it as a space that has a history that is, needs to be shared and honored. Uh, so future Reclaiming Shingwak Hall exhibition plans were actually already in the planning phases for this space and really seeing it of more of a participatory gallery space and it's telling a much wider history. So talking about the land that we're on, the colonization that has happened on this land and decolonization that's happening in communities right now. Also addressing broader issues that have been connected with residential school and colonialism in this land and building in um, art as a way to interpret some of those events and histories. And like I said, really making it more participatory based or hands-on learning engaged in space for workshop and educational programming to happen. Um, and when that is done, we will definitely share all the news with folks, but we're hoping in 2021. Um, so I'm going to leave it there for now, and I am definitely happy to answer questions 
and talk more about specific components of the exhibition space. And yeah, we can go from there. Okay, I'm just trying to scroll through, to see if there's questions. Uh, so there was one question if the exhibition space was picked because of where the entrance doors were, and I'd say partially um, that definitely it impacted how we structured the exhibition uh, so like inter introductory text panels and stuff are all located near that entrance but another reason that that hallway was selected is because of its connection to the auditorium space um, and also because uh, it's a high traffic area in the university so having that exhibition there means that it's very clear that this building was a residential school. I don't think you can be a student at Algoma or a visitor at Algoma anymore and not realize the history of the site. Um, and if folks have questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask vocally if that's easier. Okay, there's one question about uh, archives that might find residential school records or photographs in their holdings and may not have donor paperwork. Um, so I would say that if you happen to come across these uh, best practices is a trying to, if you don't know who donated it, it is definitely harder, but trying to see if there's a community around that residential school. So like in our case, we have the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association, but there are other survivor groups dedicated to uh, specific residential schools across the country. And yeah, it's definitely a tricky call around return, uh, restrict them, limit access. Um, I would tend to a, try and find a survivor community to work with. Uh, but not share them openly unless you have consent from survivors or their families. Um, so maybe limit access to specific communities or write a note in the description itself indicating that you have them and that survivors and their families are welcome to look at them, but they're not posted publicly. Um. Yeah, and so there's also a question about uh, the university being named Shingwak University. And so Algoma University is keeping its name as Algoma University, but we actually have a partner organization that's on the site that is a indigenous run post-secondary institution and they're named Shingwak Kinamagagamig, which the literal translation uh, from Anishinaabe Moan to English is Shingwak University. So that does exist on the site right now. Krista? Yeah. Um, I mean, this, this is, has proven to be such an amazing project and it's received a lot of recognition and rightly so. I'm wondering uh, across our country here, uh, across the continent even, um, has has this work inspired other projects of a similar nature? And if so, can you share um, share some of those experiences? Because because I really think um, this this has been a, an important, uh, if I can use the term, cutting edge uh, kind of exhibit that um, allows stories to be told from the from a perspective of the survivors themselves. Is that happening uh, elsewhere in a significant way? Yeah, and I think you're definitely seeing it at other sites, particularly like 
UBC's Indian Residential School Dialogue Center is doing a lot of great work. Um, the Legacy of Hope Foundation has been doing great work for decades. They specialize in traveling exhibitions um, and they're recently updating some of their exhibits to make them virtual and digital as well, especially in this era of COVID. Um, the Woodland Cultural Center in Brantford, Ontario is also um, another great site. They're currently working to raise funds to uh, get the Mohawk Institute back in shape so that it can be used for this type of programming. Uh, so there's definitely pockets across the country. And I think looking at some of the larger museums, so things like um, the Museum for Human Rights, the Canadian History Museum, you're seeing more and more museum and archival professionals really recognizing the importance of working with survivors. And those institutions are at varying stages of making that happen in their exhibitions and in their programming. Um, there's one other question around um, making sure students understand the significance of the school. Um, and like, and I definitely know that that like can't they just get over it like why does this have to be in all of our classes things like that that's a feeling that is sometimes popped up at Algoma and at the site and I think um, this is definitely something that Liz and the rest of the Shingwalk Residential School Center staff have been working on we're now really integrated into a lot of different university programming, everything from orientation for new students to classroom visits and um, trying to make sure that the special mission of the university and the history of the site isn't forgotten. And Liz might be able to speak a bit more to that if she feels so inclined. Thanks, Krista. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody verbally uh, for joining us today and, and certainly thank you to Krista and really the rest of our team who continues to ensure that the legacy of the residential school era is not forgotten, that the 40 plus years of work that the children of Shingwalk, who we lovingly call our grandmas and grandpas at Algoma University, uh, the work, their life's work that has been done and continues to be done, and really the importance of the next generation. Uh, myself, you know, my, both my parents went to residential school. Jay, his mom was significant in this movement of Children of Shingwak alumni and the establishment of this legacy here on this property, you know, the, the whole story behind uh, Chief Shingwak's original vision of a teaching wigwam. And, and the fact that, you know, this, this chief over 150 years ago, um, you know, or within the last 150 years, had this dream, this vision of bringing people together, the settler community who wasn't going anywhere, the Anishinaabe Ojibwe community in, in whose traditional territory, you know, we're in currently, and, and um, bringing, bringing us together for the purposes of learning, sharing uh, from each other. Um, it is something that uh, in today's world, um, really, when you think about the things that are going on in the world, has really gained some, some, some extra special significant meaning for me and many others who, you know, have reflected over the past couple of months with what's going on in our world. And um, yesterday, actually, I had the privilege of being back on campus. We're slowly returning to campus in our, our return to work our, sorry, return to campus plan. And my first day, first afternoon back was yesterday. And, and I had a group of students who are taking a high school dual credit course with Algoma University. And they were there. Uh, this course is an elective. It's not a mandatory one for them to have as a graduation requirement. They were there because they wanted to be. They were there because they continue to, to make up this new generation of, of people who are interested in finding out more, uh, wanting to do better, not only for themselves, but for the world human family that we belong to. And I had the experience and blessing in the fall of being a part of a, a circle, uh, a group conversation, where one of our current students actually said, um, 
because right now at Algoma University, we have over 50 countries represented in our student population at all three campuses. And uh, this young man, one of our students said, do you think this is what Chief Shingwak was talking about when he said to bring you know, people together for the purposes of learning? I absolutely believe this. Uh, shared this message yesterday, shared Dylan's message, you know, his, his, his question, his pondering. And many of us at uh, the institution, from staff to students to faculty um, to admin leadership, really absolutely believe this. And, and it intrinsically is a part of our special mission, the charter of Algoma University. And um, so as Krista has indicated, you know, we've had uh, some real great commitment, uh, stated, shared, um, actioned, you know, it, it, it is actually being followed through on now of um, making sure that we keep this legacy, you know, this important historic information um, alive by telling it with love and kindness. And um, the amount of people who are committed to ensuring that we tell the truth, we talk the truth, we remember the truth, uh, and we do so in a good way uh, is amazing to me. As a first generation out, uh, I'm very grateful for that every single day. And so um, we want to bring along the people who might be saying, you know, how come we have to learn about this? Or how come we have to talk about this? Um, there are still, sadly, many current day traumas that we see in the world of Anishinaabe people that are multi-generational because of this time. And so in order to understand how come we are the way that we are, we must know the wound. Um, there are actually many great people who believe that. And uh, in order to know the wound, you have to talk about it. So, um, you know, Today is a good day, as any, to talk about things. We're really thankful to have such a great turnout for uh, Krista's presentation of this amazing exhibit called Reclaiming Shingwak Hall. Um, we certainly invite you as the, uh, the world returns to whatever might, we might call normal, um, it will be a new normal. We certainly invite you, should you have the time, in the time to come, when our virtual tour becomes available uh, to take it, we also invite you, certainly, if you have the ability to stop by Sault Ste. Marie, wherever you are, I see that you're from all over the province uh, and other places, if you have the ability to make it to Bawating or Sault Ste. Marie to the, the hallways of uh, Shingwak Hall um, to come and see this, this uh, historic and uh, really beautiful um, story uh, captivated in in this uh, exhibit, these different exhibits that uh, Krista has has talked about today. So Chimigwech for asking that question. Chimigwech for uh, being willing to listen um, and uh, participate today and certainly wish you well. Miigwech, Krista. Oh, no problem. Um, I've seen a couple more questions. One was about uh, how often we update the exhibition. Uh, so this was designed as a permanent exhibition. Right now, we have updated the photos in the digital photo frames, I think twice, and it's been open for about two years. Um, when the next phase moves into the auditorium, um, some of those pieces will be more movable and flexible and might be able to be replaced every six months or so to showcase different local artists and different um, pieces of work that are made in participatory workshops. Um, Kim, I saw your question too. Are you talking about exterior Shingwa call, about the auditorium? The interior of the auditorium. I think that was about probably about three years ago when they were talking about the changes inside the auditorium. So where is that stand? Where does that stand? Um, so that stands, that's the next phase of this exhibition project. And so hopefully by 2021, it will be done. That being said, the like shell or the look and feel of the auditorium, we're gonna try and keep as close to its current or its original 
uh, state. So things like all that like 1980s lighting that's up on the auditorium ceiling right now would all be pulled down to expose that original woodwork. Uh, likewise, there's an older sound booth that was installed. We're hoping to remove that and really open up some of those original spaces. So it's in the works. Uh, there's also a great suggestion about um, intergenerational folks contributing to the exhibition, and I think that's a great idea. Um, and we do work with some intergenerational uh, people, but definitely we always welcome more uh, people contributing and reaching out to share and uh, work with us. Um, so there's another question about the National Chiefs Library. So that is actually with Shingwak Kinumagagamik. So the Shingwak Residential School Center isn't directly involved in that, but yes, there are, is still plans for that to be located on the Shingwak site, but it would be in the new building that uh, the Shingwak Education Trust and Shingwak Kinumagagamik are opening relatively soon. So I can't actually speak to that as I am working there. <laughs> Um, so yes, we're, we're working on getting that set up. The new building hopefully will be opened in the next month or so. I think they're just kind of finishing final touches inside. Um, and so we're working on um, just kind of collecting all the books together. I know we have a number of shipments of more books coming in um, and we're hoping to have those cataloged uh, soon. And so hopefully by the fall, um, the library will be open. Um, so we'll have books relating to uh, Indigenous culture, Indigenous history, um, language, just a whole range of topics, uh, as well as we're hoping to have some archival materials in there as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully that'll get going uh, by the fall. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much where we're at, just still, still in the planning phases. All right, well, I think that sort of wraps it up. Thank you so much, Krista. That was an amazing presentation. I learned so much and I'm sure everyone who's here today did as well. Thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, we've got another question. <laughs> as, okay, that, yeah. How do you interpret privacy legislation with the use of indigenous photographs and collections? Um, yeah, that is a tricky one. And no, happy to talk about it. Um, so we tend to use uh, OCAP as the guiding principle, as well as looking to the Chilna Shingwak Alumni Association. Both of those really privilege indigenous intellectual property rights, not necessarily Western copyright. Uh, so even though something might be in the public domain, if it's not okay with survivors or indigenous community members, we're not gonna share it. It's really up to them. Okay, are there any more questions? All right. Well, in that case, uh, thank you so much. Thank you everyone so much for attending um, and sharing your questions and your insight with us. Um, I am going to add to this chat right now a link to a survey um, that it would be really helpful to us if you filled out. I will also post it on the Facebook page in case anyone doesn't have the time to do it right now but would like to get it late, get to it later. Um, so I think that's everything for us. We will be doing some more webinars and workshops coming up. We're working on developing one for next month that I think is going to be very, very exciting. So stay tuned and thank you everyone and have a beautiful day.